safety management. Here are the following learning objectives. After studying this chapter, you should be able to define the term an intentional injury and explain why the victims are most often young children. Describe the four basic principles of risk management. Discuss safety practices that teachers should implement in the classroom and outdoors to safeguard children. Lastly, identify two forms of negligence and discuss steps teachers can take to protect themselves from such charges. Common Causes of Childhood Death The most common causes of death due to unintentional injury include motor vehicles, as pedestrians, riding a bicycle, or wheeled toy, drowning in swimming pools, spas, bathtubs, ponds, toilets, and buckets, burns from fireplaces, appliances, grills, chemicals, electrical outlets, residential fires, and fireworks. Suffocation from plastic bags, entrapment in chests or appliances, bedding, aspiration of small objects. Falls from stairs, furniture, play equipment, and windows. Lastly, poisoning from pain relievers, vitamins with iron, carbon monoxide, cleaning products, insecticides, and cosmetics. Here is the table that shows common causes of childhood death due to unintentional injury. Source is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or CDC Web-Based Injury Statistics Query and Reporting System 2006 and an Unintentional Injuries Deaths ages 1 to 4 and 5 to 9. What is unintentional injury? Or what do you mean by unintentional injury? The term unintentional injury has replaced accidents when referring to injuries sustained by children. This is because in most instances, factors contributing to an accident are preventable. Childhood injuries are most often attributed to environmental hazards, lack of appropriate planning, and adult supervision, or a child's immature development. Conditions that are all manageable with improved knowledge and awareness. Infants and toddlers are at highest risk for sustaining life-threatening injuries and medical emergency. Their interest and curiosity in learning about their surroundings, impulsive play, and immature development can unfortunately lead children into new and unexpected dangers. Lastly, Likewise, older children continue to explore their environment with an even greater sense of enthusiasm, yet they still lack an adult's maturity, experience, and understanding necessary to anticipate the consequences of their behavior. Thus, adults must be continuously aware of children's developmental abilities and behavioral characteristics as well as potential environmental hazards in their efforts to protect children from injury. Teachers and administrators assume a major role and responsibility for protecting the safety of children in their care. This can be a particularly challenging task given the ages of children typically enrolled in early education programs, elementary schools, and before and after school programs. However, teachers' unique training and experience enables them to implement safety measures that can eliminate needless childhood injuries.
Likewise, all their children continue to explore their environment with an even greater sense of enthusiasm, yet they still lack an adult's maturity, experience, and understanding necessary to anticipate the consequences of their behavior. Let's talk about now the risk management principles and preventive measures. Prevention of an intentional injury requires continuous awareness and implementation of risk management measures. Teachers and families must consider the element of safety in everything they do with young children. This includes the rooms they organize, toys they purchase, and learning activities they plan. To new teachers or busy parents, this step may seem unnecessarily time-consuming. However, these are precisely the times when it is important to focus extra attention on children's safety. Any amount of preventive effort is worth the time if it spares one child from injury. Knowledge of children's developmental skills is essential for protecting their safety, according to Berg, 2008. Understanding the differences in their cognitive, motor, social, and emotional abilities at various stages help adults to anticipate children's actions and take steps to avoid unintentional injury. For example, knowing that infants put everything into their mouth should alert teachers to be extra vigilant of small items such as paper clip or a pen cap that, that might be dropped on the floor. Understanding that toddlers enjoy climbing, should alert adults to the importance of fastening bookshelves and large pieces of play equipment securely to the wall or floor, so they won't tip over. Recognizing that four-year-olds limited understanding of cause and effects makes them more vulnerable to hazardous situations in their environment is useful when designing a classroom or play yard or knowing that boys are more likely to be involved in accidents than girls due to their preference for play that involves active, aggressive, and risk-taking behaviors can be used when planning large motor activities. When adults are familiar with typical child development and understand that children develop at different rates, they can use this information for planning children's environments, preparing learning activities, selecting appropriate play equipment indoor and outdoor, establishing safety guidelines, supervising children's learning play experiences, and developing safety education programs. It is important to recognize that circumstances such as fatigue, change, or disruption increase the risk of an intentional so these are the conditions that contribute to an intentional injury. The risk of injury is greatest when adults are not feeling well and suffering from symptoms of illness, discomfort, or fatigue. Adults are angry, emotionally upset, or faced with a difficult situation. New teachers, staff members, or visitors who are unfamiliar with the children and their routines are present and conditions are rushed or planned late in the day. The risk of injury is greatest when there is a shortage of teachers, too few adults to provide adequate supervision, children are not able to play outdoors due to inclement weather, new children are included in a group and are unfamiliar with the environment, rules and expectations, and rules have not been formulated or explained carefully. Teachers are exposed to children's communicable illnesses on a daily basis. Calling in sick often creates a staff shortage since substitutes may be difficult to locate. For your reflection, kindly answer the following questions. How can a teacher determine if he or she is too sick to come to work? What are the risks involved in 
coming to work when you are sick. Last question, how might teacher illnesses contribute to children's unintentional injury? Let us define the following terms. Unintentional injury means unexpected or unplanned event that may result in physical harm or injury. While risk management means measures taken to avoid an event such as an injury or illness from occurring, implies the ability to anticipate circumstances and behaviors. Despite adults' best efforts, it is not possible to prevent every childhood injury, regardless of how much care is exercised. Some circumstances will be beyond a teacher's or parent's ability to control. For example, no amount of appropriate planning or supervision can prevent a toddler from suddenly bumping into a table edge or an older child unexpectedly losing his grip while climbing. However, the number and seriousness of injuries can be significantly reduced when basic risk management principles are followed. Planning in advance, establishing safety policies and guidelines, maintaining good quality supervision, and providing for safety education. Advanced planning. Considerable thought and planning should go into the selection of equipment, activities that are appropriate for young children. Choices must take into account children's developmental abilities and also encourage the safe acquisition of new skills. Activities should be planned and equipment selected to stimulate children's curiosity, exploration, and sense of independence without endangering their safety. When teachers invest time in planning, children are less likely to, to sustain injury because they will find the activities interesting engaging, and appropriately suited to their abilities. Examination of accident records can also be useful during the planning stage. A pattern of similar injuries may suggest that teachers need to alter the way an activity is being conducted. For example, if it is noted that children are repeatedly hurt on the same piece of outdoor play, equipment, or during a similar classroom activity, a cause must be investigated must be investigated immediately. Establishing safety policies and guidelines. Safety guidelines are statements about behavior that is considered acceptable as it relates to the welfare of an individual, concern for group safety, and respect for shared property. Too often, guidelines only inform children about what they should not be doing. They leave unclear what behaviors are valued or considered acceptable. However, when policies and guidelines are based on developmentally appropriate expectations, they can promote children's cooperative play and safe use of play equipment. Teachers can encourage children's appropriate behavior by stating safety guidelines in positive terms, such as slide down the slide on your bottom, feet first so you can see where you are going. Use only the words don't, no, or not should be used when child's immediate safety is endangered. To be most effective, policies and guidelines should be stated clearly and in simple terms that young children are able to understand. When children are also given a brief ex explanation about what and why the guidelines are needed, they are more likely to comply. When safety guidelines are established, they must also be enforced consistently or children quickly learn that they have no meaning. However, a teacher must never threaten children or cause them to be afraid in order to gain compliance. There are no universal safety rules. Individual programs must develop their own policies and guidelines based on the population of children being served, 
type of program, equipment, and available space both indoor and outdoor, number of adults available for supervision, and the nature of the activity in both. Always remember that safety policies and guidelines never replace the need for careful adult supervision. Quality supervision. Although families and teachers have many responsibilities, their supervisory role is beyond question, one of the most important. Children depend on responsible adult guidance for protection, as well as for learning appropriate safety behaviors. The younger children are, the more comprehensive and protective this supervision must be. As children gain additional motor coordination, cognitive skill, and experience in handling potentially dangerous situations, adult supervision can become less restrictive. Quality supervision is also influenced by the nature of children's activity. For example, a cooking project that involves the use of a hat appliances must be supervised more carefully than painting at an easel or putting together a puzzle. Caution! Never leave children unattended. If a teacher must leave an area, it should be supervised by another adult. Teacher Checklist on Positive Strategies for Managing Children's Inappropriate Behavior Acknowledge and give attention for appropriate and desired behavior. Redirect the child's attention to some other activity. Provide the child with an opportunity for choices. Model the appropriate and desired behavior. Teach and encourage children to use problem-solving techniques. Ignore inappropriate behaviors unless doing so is unsafe. Lastly, make changes in the environment to discourage inappropriate behavior. One of the primary methods for avoiding unintentional injury is through safety education. Children can begin learning safe behaviors as soon as they understand the meaning of words. The earlier children learn about safety, the more naturally they will develop the attitudes and respect that lead to lifelong patterns of safe behavior. A considerable amount of safety education occurs through incidental learning experiences and imitation of adult behaviors. Children who exhibit safe attitudes and practices can also serve as role models for other children. For example, several children may be jumping from the top of a platform instead of climbing down the ladder. Suddenly, one child yells, You shouldn't be doing that! We could get hurt! As a result, the children stop and begin using the ladder. Taking advantage of teachable moments can also prove to be an effective educational tool. For example, when children stand up on a swing or run with sharp objects on their hand, teachers can use these opportunities to explain why the behavior is not appropriate and help children to, pro to problem solve safer alternatives. This form of learning is often most effective and meaningful for young children. Teachers should not overlook their own safety in their concern for children. It is easy for adults to be careless when they are under stress or have worked long, hard hours. Sometimes teachers take extraordinary risks in their efforts to help children. However, it is at these times that even greater caution must be exercised. Planning scheduled breaks and maintaining healthful eating habits will improve a teacher's alertness and ability to make sound decisions. Much of the responsibility for maintaining a safe classroom environment belongs to teachers. Their knowledge of child development and daily contact with children give them a good position for identifying problem areas. However, safety must be a concern of all school personnel, including support staff, such as classroom aides, cooks, receptionists, bus drivers, maintenance and housekeeping personnel. Each person observes the environment differently and may detect a safety hazard that had previously gone unnoticed. 
toys and equipment. The majority of childhood deaths and injuries involving toys and play equipment are due to choking and improper use. Many of these injuries can be prevented by carefully selecting equipment and toys that are developmentally appropriate. Children's interest, behavioral characteristics, and developmental abilities should serve as key considerations when choosing these items. Age warning on product labels do not take into account children's individual differences and therefore are not always reliable. Injuries are also more likely to occur when children attempt to use educational materials and play equipment intended for older children, such as toys that are too heavy for young children to lift, rungs that are too large for small hands to grip securely, steps that are too far apart, climbing equipment and platforms that are too high above the ground, balloons and small objects that can cause choking or suffocation, and lastly, equipment that is unstable or not securely anchored. Guidelines for selecting safe toys and play equipment. Consider children's age, interests, and developmental abilities, including problem solving and reasoning skills. Check manufacturer's label, Carefully for recommendations and warnings. Choose fabric items that are washable and labeled flame retardant or non-flammable. Look for high quality construction. Check durability, good design, stability, absence of sharp corners or wires, and strings shorter than 12 inches or 30 cm. Select toys that are made from non-toxic paints and materials. Avoid toys and play materials with small pieces that a child could choke on. Select toys and equipment that are appropriate for the amount of available play and storage space. Avoid toys with electrical parts or those that are propelled through the air. Choose play materials that children can use with minimal adult supervision. Here are the examples of appropriate toy choices for infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. Manufacturers are now labeling toys with age guidelines to help adults make safer choices. However, a child's chronological age does not necessarily reflect his or her developmental skills and abilities. For your reflection, kindly answer the following questions. What is meant by the term developmentally appropriate? How can a parent determine this? Why are age guidelines not always a reliable method? for selecting children's toy and play equipment. Where can a parent or teacher locate information about product, safety, and classroom activities? Safety must always be a priority when teachers select, plan, and implement children's learning activities. The potential for injury is present in nearly every activity whether it is planned for indoor or outdoor settings, according to Obeng 2009. Even small metal or plastic gold gloves can cause harm when children use them incorrectly. Teachers should ask themselves the following questions when evaluating the safety of any activity. First, is the activity age and developmentally appropriate? What potential risks or hazards does this activity present? What special precautions do I need to take to make the activity safe? How should I respond if a child misuses the equipment or 
doesn't follow directions. Lastly, what would I do in the event that a child is hurt while the activity is in progress? After these questions have been given carefully thought, teachers can begin to consider how to implement basic risk management principles such as advanced planning, formulating safety guidelines, determining appropriate supervision, and providing safety education. Added safety precautions and more precise planning may be necessary whenever the following high-risk items are used as part of an activity. Pointed or blunt objects such as scissors, knives, and woodworking tools, for example, hammers, nails, and saws, pipes, boards, blocks, or breakable objects, electrical appliances such as hot plates, radio, and mixers, hot liquids such as wax, syrup, oil, and water, then cosmetics or cleaning supplies. For added safety, projects that include any of these items should be set up in an area separated from other activities. Excursions away from a program's facilities can be an exciting part of children's educational experiences. However, field trips present added risks and liability concerns for schools and early education programs and therefore require the special precautions. Programs should have written policies outlining procedures that must be followed when taking children on field trips. Families should be informed in advance of an outing and the written permission obtained for each excursion. On the day of the trip, a notice should be posted on the classroom door to remind families and staff of the children's destination and when they will be leaving and returning to the building. At least one adult accompanying the group should have first aid and CPR training. A first aid kit and cell phone should also be taken along. Tags can be pinned on children with the center's name and phone number. A complete list of the children's emergency contact information, including family's telephone numbers, child's physician, and emergency service such as ambulance, fire, numbers, should also be taken along. Pets can be a special classroom addition, but care must be taken so this is also a safe experience for both the children and animals. Children's allergies should be considered before pets visit or become permanent classroom residents. Some animals such as turtles, fish, and birds are known carriers of illnesses that are communicable to humans such as salmonella, and are therefore not appropriate to include in the classroom. Children must always wash their hands carefully after handling or petting animals in the classroom, zoo, or petting farm because animals are often carriers of infectious illnesses. Legal Implications Safety issues have always generated a great deal of concern for teachers, school administrators, and program directors. Teachers should be familiar with the legal issues and responsibilities that affect their positions for several reasons. The most important legal concerns for teachers center on the issues of liability. Teachers are expected to have special training and to possess unique knowledge, skills, and experience. Let us define the following term, liability. The term
Term liability refers to the legal obligations and professional responsibilities, especially those related to safety, that are accepted by the administrators and teachers when they agree to work with children. Negligence Failure to perform these duties in a reasonable and acceptable manner is considered negligence. Here's the summary of our lesson. Unintentional injuries are the leading cause of death among young children. Limited motor, problem solving, and anticipatory skills increase young children's risk of experiencing unintentional injury. The incidence of unintentional injury among children can be reduced when adults adhere to the principles of risk management, advanced planning, establishing safety policies and guidelines, providing appropriate supervision, and conducting safety education. Teachers must continuously be aware of safety in children's environments, from the toys and equipment presented to all planned activities including field trips. Lastly, teachers have a professional and moral obligation to take the precautionary measures necessary to protect children's well-being. Failure to uphold this responsibility could potentially result in negligence charges.